getting started. Just give it another couple of minutes, just letting everyone in. Are we nearly ready to start, folks? Yes, we're ready to start, Jane. Lovely. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to our panel discussion on children's human rights and the early years sector. So my name is Jane Brumpton and I am Chief Executive of Early Years Scotland, and I'm absolutely delighted to be the facilitator for today's event. Um, Early Years Scotland, we're a national third sector organisation, and we support young children, babies, and their families pre-birth to five, as well as supporting the Early Years sector through membership and other services. So this event is, is really close to my heart because in Early Years Scotland, the, all the staff are really committed to supporting our members nationally and all those involved in working with and on behalf of Scotland's youngest children. And we really want children to be empowered and to be aware of their rights and, and also support staff to promote rights-based relationships and approaches within their settings so that all babies and young children have the best start in life as a result. Um, we really aim for children's rights to be realised and that they're consulted in every way about decisions that affect their lives in a meaningful way. So delighted to be um, supporting this event. And it's being hosted today by Children's Parliament and Catanach as part of the Year of Childhood. So today's event will be a one hour long event and will include reflections on this very important subject from our panellists followed by a Q&A session as well. So your cameras, as you can see, and your microphones are off for the duration of the webinar. But please do continue to share your thoughts and any questions that you have for the panelists in the Q&A box as we go along. So as you can imagine, although we can only take a, a few questions today, we'll, we'll use these and all the comments um, to support continued dialogue on the subject after this event. If you do have any technical issues, we, we go for the, the very simple <laughs> format of try leaving the webinar in the first instance and then logging back in. Hopefully that works, but if not, please do let us know. So you'll have heard that the recording is being, um, sorry, the webinar is being recorded today and it will be hosted on the Children's Parliament website and YouTube channel. We would love you to engage with social media as well. So if you would like to share any feedback or comments live um, or after the event on social media, the hashtag is hashtag year of childhood 2021. So why is this event happening today? As I'm sure many of you are aware, on the 16th of March, MSPs voted unanimously to make children's rights as outlined in the, U the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child law in Scotland. So this reflects, as we know, the increasing support for children's human rights across Scotland's public bodies and services. But what does that mean for those of us um, today? I'm sure many of you are from the early years sector. What does that mean to us? So this will be the second of three discussions that we host on this topic. And the aim of these events is to bring together stakeholders in early years to discuss how human rights can be promoted developed and embedded in practice. And I think that's the, the key part, isn't it? How do we meaningfully embed this in our practice? So the focus in this discussion will be understanding how children's rights can be incorporated into practice in the early years. Unfortunately, our speakers from Calder Bridge Primary School that was on the original agenda, they're unable to make it today. However, don't, be, don't despair. We still have two fabulous speakers joining us for today's panel, and we'll hear from them shortly. 
So I'd just like to introduce who we have today. Our first speaker will be Sarah Lane. And Sarah is the Senior Practitioner at Innerwick Early Year Setting in East Lothian. She's been researching and developing child's voice practice and theory alongside her colleagues since 2013. And Sarah's research project for the BA in Childhood Practice degree focused on listening to children and how best to enable them to participate meaningfully in decision making. A form of rights-based practice called Map Do Review evolved from that research and has been developed and refined since that time. Sarah has shared this approach through workshops, presentations and tours of the setting. In 2019, the Scottish Government ELC Innovation Award was awarded to the team and Map Do Review went through further quality improvement with Sarah leading on that project. Then we're going to have our second speaker today that is Dr Lynn McNair and Dr McNair is Head of Cowgate Under 5 Centre in Edinburgh and is a lecturer in Early Childhood and Fribble Research Fellow at the University of Edinburgh. Lynn has more than 40 years experience working in early years education and was awarded an OBE for services to early education in 2009. Lynn is a trained Fribellian, attaining her certificate at the Fribble Institute, Roehampton University in London. Lynn is also the programme director for Fribble in childhood practice uh, at the University U of E, sorry, <laughs> um, course, and is the pathway coordinator of the newly developed MSc in education, early childhood practice in Fribble. Lynn regularly travels the globe sharing her knowledge on these principles and philosophies. And she's well published and is an award-winning author. Finally, Lynn would say her passion for egalitarianism, emancipation, democracy, and a belief that children are rich, active, resourceful beings came from being a mother to Kurt and Misha and what she learned as she had observed them playing freely as children. This way of being with children, trusting them in them and their abilities and capabilities is where she puts her energy into her work with children today. So I'm sure you will be delighted to hear from both speakers and I have great delight in handing over to Sarah for our first input. Thank you, Sarah. Um, hello, everybody. I hope you can see me. Can I be seen? Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm just going to about to share my screen with you, but just to say I'm delighted to be here and um, to share our practice that we have been developing at Innerwick Early Years, and I will just share the screen. So um, hopefully that can be seen. Um, so um, I am the senior practitioner at Innerwick Early Years setting in East Lothian. And um, we have been developing a form of uh, listening to children and um, it's called Map to Review. So I've called my presentation Developing Child's Voice Practice and we see it as a rights-based approach. Ooh. Trying to... My screen won't move. Oh. Let me see if I can get out of that. What is escape I'm, and come yeah, off escape. escape? I'm trying to, when we practiced it, it moved. I know, it's so, difficult. Okay. Screen won't move. What would you suggest I do? Escape? Escape, yes. And I no, think try and no. Unless I've frozen, but I can't be because I'm talking to you. No, escape's not working either. It's just on my screen and it won't do a thing. Oh, okay. ah. so I'll just go the traditional way from the beginning. <laughs> Hopefully that might, oh, okay, I don't know. I apologize, I don't know what happened there. Um, a little blip in Dunbar. Anyway, so uh, the ELC team at Inuit Early Year Setting are passionate about listening to children's voices, play-based pedagogy that we have been developing together as a team um, over about the last eight years, uh, child's rights, um, children's rights to be heard and to play. We have been developing a rights-based approach consistently as a team since 2013, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today, Map Do Review. 
Um, it reflects and um, enshrines articles 12, 13, and 31, um, particularly uh, from the UNCRC. So um, I'm posing the question, what is our rights-based practice? A map do review is a form of participatory practice which enables children to be heard on a daily basis. It supports young children to talk about their play and to act upon their own intentions. The process starts each year with children creating a map together. The um, map is, sorry, this box is in the way. Move that box over there. Sorry, my, my box of myself was in the way of the text. I do apologize. The map is made from children's own photos of favorite play areas. So we start the process off with the children touring the setting. They have the, the camera themselves and they're clicking away. And um, so to us, we see this as a form of voice. This is one of their many voices. Practitioners support the process, but children very much lead the map making. And here are two children making um, this year's map. So the map is a representation of the learning environment inside and outside. The map is put on display and throughout the year, children engage as and when they wish. A cycle of engagement takes place and is repeated many times over a full year. However, this depends on each child's use of the method. We have some children that use it daily. As soon as they've written a plan, they put it into action. They very quickly want to write a review and right on to another plan. We have some children that might just use it once a week or some children just use it every few weeks. It completely depends on the individual child. So planning starts with the child coming to sit at the map with a practitioner helping. Um, they formulate a plan together. Um, this plan here, which I'll write a read out to because I rather like this one. I want to make a plan for outside is to play tennis like swish and then bang and then do the scooters and the bikes. I'm going to play and play and play and play. I am playing with someone and is H because I love him. So um, that was a fantastic plan. And this little girl went straight out and put her plan into action. So um, we, the, the practitioner facilitates the writing of the plan. This child has also done some mark making on her plan. And we see this very much as a time for listening to children. Um, and we encourage the child to take their time. We don't want them to rush the process at all. So doing is the next stage. Children act upon their plans when they wish. Some of them go straight away and act on a plan. And some may, might take a week to act on a plan. It's completely up to them. Plans involve solitary and collaborative play and can include practitioners. I'm, I'm up here getting ready to run with um, two girls. And um, I think I did rather a lot of running that day, but that was good. Okay, so the next stage of map do review is the review stage. Children write reviews with practitioners support. Thumb images are used to guide children's reflections. So we have these images set out and they choose which image supports their thoughts. So this child H, I want the one that don't like it. So he knew that thumb down means don't like it because I don't like it anymore because F bumped onto me. So I don't like this anymore, this plan, and that's it. So he was very sure about that plan. A great review. Children are very independent. They add their plans, reviews, and any associated photos, marks, drawings to their folders themselves. Um, K is sitting, sitting on the floor, working away, using scissors, using the glue, and um, very independent. Um, we have paper-based learning stories in um, East Lothian. Uh, a lot of settings do still use these paper-based books, and she, um, she's attaching her plan to her pages. So I thought I'd also mention, how do we help young children become aware of and understand their rights? So we, at our setting, we use um, the eight wellbeing indicators to support discussions with children about their rights. These particular images come from the care inspectorate. 
Um, so they're nothing to do with me. We didn't design them. I, I got them as PDFs from the Care Inspectorate quite a few years ago. And, and the children love them. We've got them laminated um, and they pull them off and they talk about them whenever, whenever you know, they want to chat about particular rights. And beside the map, we have a very clear message about respect and voice. And it, it acts as a talking point when we're writing a plan or we're listening to a child. You know, we can sometimes mention that we respect them and that it, it is their right to be heard and to be listened to. I thought I would end with this lovely plan that R wrote um, a few days ago. I'm going to play at horses with K. We're going to play and play and play. I'm going to eat blue grass and we need to cut some. I'm going to be a blue horse or a green horse. Can I be an orange horse? And I'm going to be a unicorn. Now she wrote this on the 1st of December, but then she didn't put her plan into action until the 9th of December. And, and that was her choice. She suddenly decided one day, I'm going to do it. And here she is rushing around the nursery in full action. And she shouted out, I'm an orange unicorn and I can fly. And I just love that lovely comment. Um, I've got my information down at the bottom there. Um, if anybody needs any more information, um, you're very willing, welcome to um, write to me. I've got various things that I could share, PowerPoints and such. And that's me, thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sarah. That was so interesting. I just, I wanted to hear more and I wanted to see more of the, the images as well. I am really, really appreciate that. And I see there's requests for access to your PowerPoint. So I think more people want to take time to digest that. But I loved one of the quotes when you said that children act on their plans when they wish. And, and I think throughout everything that you described there, Sarah, you, you can see it's a real child-centered approach and that respects children's choice and their ability to plan their day. I, I just thought that was wonderful. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Greatly appreciated. And what we're going to do now is move on to our next speaker. And Lynn, we're delighted to have Dr. Lynn McNair. And we will hear Lynn's reflections on rights-based approaches within her setting. So Delighted to hand over to yourself, Lynn. Thank you. And I'm just about to sh uh, share my screen, hopefully. Here we go. Um, and didn't you, didn't I just love that? I'm an orange unicorn and I can fly. <laughs> a great, a great um, thing to be. Um, so this is my presentation, but sorry, it's starting a bit later. There you go. Um, and I, in some ways, don't think for one minute that my design means I don't take children's rights seriously. Um, but I just thought because we are talking about um, children here and also the time of year, I decided to uh, create it on this, um, this kind of format. What I intend to do, if this is um, if in a similar way to Sarah, is that I want to draw from an example of practice where I believe that rights kind of permeates um, what we do at, at children's rights, permeate kind of what we do at Cowgate Under Five Centre. Um, I want to just draw from one example of uh, practice because, you know, this it's a, a quite a tight um, presentation. It's not very long. And I've chosen to um, look at one example of practice where I really believe that we support uh, children's rights. So I'm going to look at pedagogical documentation. And I think when we're thinking about the way that we um, gather our documentation on children, I think that we need to think about what kind of pedagogy really supports children's rights. And I would say um, play in a, a richly resourced physical environment does. Um, giving children the time or, and you know, giving's even an interesting word, but children having the time and space to pursue their interests, their own curiosity and relationships. 
And I think we de there's no doubt in anyone's mind, I'm absolutely sure, that we need sensitive adults who listen to children. And, um, and we know that this isn't something that happens overnight. It takes time to hone those relationships, to get to know those children, and to get to know the way that they're expressing themselves. So we need to notice their interests and support them through their dialogue. Again, also very importantly for us at Cowgate, for sure, we adults aren't there just as transmitters of knowledge, but they're there to um, share and have this kind of dialogic pedagogy with our children. And when I was preparing here, I was thinking, how, how can I get this over to this um, audience about kind of the pedagogical approach I'm kind of talking about? And it's it's undoubtedly a participatory uh, style of pedagogy. But we want to do we want to kind of disrupt the normalization of children and childhood. And I think we we're doing that when we're thinking about children's rights. We want to have alternative ways of of seeing and being with our children and we want to do this thinking with our children together and not not again this adult um, transmission of knowledge. So when we think about a participatory pedagogy, we're thinking about it in a way that asserts children's rights, uh, but not just um, for the children themselves. We want to have an ethos where uh, the rights of everyone using the setting, visitors to the setting, have all their rights respected. And, you know, I know that um, for the Children's Parliament, they talk about children's human rights. And I totally love that, that phrase because I feel that um, we all need uh, our rights respected. The other thing a participatory pedagogy does is it answers to the kind of complexity of childhood. It admits that a childhood is not linear, it's not um, frozen in one, um, in any respect. And, it, you know, we're, we're looking at a pedagogy that's democratic, it's participatory, but it's also progressive. And I, I absolutely know that our Scottish government would be delighted with um, this kind of progressive way of um, working with children. Cowgate Under Five Centre is underpinned by the um, principles of Friedrich Froebel. And I think it's um, really worthwhile noting that um, Froebel was a participatory pedagogue himself. And he viewed the child as curious and competent and a participant being. And he also argued that um, it was really critical that we listen to children. We documented and attuned um, their learning. But it was also about uh, providing companionship with children. And of course, for Froebel, relationships were at the, the heart and those interactions were at the heart of um, everything we did. And, and, you know, participatory pedagogy is, is in contrast or, or opposition to transmissive pedagogy. So where the child is like this empty vessel um, that we, we've heard about in the past, um, with the child as a not yet being, um, and the, the practitioner is this transmitter. Um, that is kind of that transmissive model, and uh, we need to think about that. So we, in consideration of all of this at Cowgate, we uh, carried out a piece of research that was funded by the Froebel Trust, and and we came up with this way of documenting learning that was much more respectful of children, respectful of their rights, respectful of them as um, individuals and unique beings. And um, we wanted to um, capture their everyday moments um, in a way that uh, was, you know, really important um, in a way for children themselves. I'm a big fan of this, and I think this is where <coughs> our, our kind of starting point is. So if you think about Mikhail Bakhtin's work, he says individuals are diverse, complex and irregular. They're not fixed entities, but full of surprise, possibilities and potentialities. Um, as an adult, I'm still learning loads of different things. I'm still learning books. I'm still challenged by conceptualizations. I'm still reading about theoretical practices. And 
I, I really feel that we really must respect that children are not finished products when they've they've learned something. But as Bacton says, they're irregular and they're full of surprises. So we um, began this process. We we are, it's based on the model of learning stories from New Zealand, which I'm highly highly respectful of. But um, we. It, within the um, New Zealand model, every um, moment is a learning moment, but we discovered that there was also um, other moments that we would call civic moments in children's lives. And so through this process of through this research, we moved from learning stories to lived stories and they have a narrative. Um, there's a professional analysis and possible provocation and with your permission, because I've got a little bit more extra time, I'm going to read you um, a, a, a lived story. So they're quite intimate. So here we start with, Dear Oleg, yesterday you celebrated your fourth birthday with your family at home. Today we wondered if you would like to celebrate turning um, four with your Cowgate family. Yes, said with enthusiasm was your answer. On a table in the living room, you and I shared preparing some things we might need to make a birthday cake by looking at the start of a sequence book that can help us. A bowl, scales, weights, spoons, knife, forks, flour, butter, baking powder and bananas instead of eggs and sugar. I passed an open jar of cocoa powder to you. You sniffed it. I asked you if you wanted to use it for your cake and you said yes with a smile. I think you like the smell of cocoa powder, Oleg. Soon Ada, Ailish and Finlay and his brother Pip joined us at the table and together we peeled quite a lot of bananas, seven, to make the cake sweet. You all started to mash the bananas with a fork while Finlay chanted, mash banana, mash banana, mash banana. Oleg, did you notice how the banana seemed to change from solid to a wet mush? Next, some dairy-free um, spread was measured out by you and together you and I found a 100 gram weight to place on the scale and then you scooped out the spread into the scale bowl with your knife and the scale moved up and the weight and spread and it looked like the scales had balanced or at least were as heavy as each other. You plopped the spread into the big bowl and mashed the banana inside. Follow, following Ailish's lead, we all began mashing the spread into the banana with forks and took turns using a wooden bowl. When we suggested that it was time to add something to make the, the cake chocolate, and you added about four big spoons of cocoa powder to the mixture in the big bowl. While the cakes were cooking, Oleg, I noticed that you were using a dustpan and brush to sweep the floor. And it goes on to um, explain how he really does like um, cleaning the flour from under the table. And his friends joined him and he, um, he was very much involved in the process and um, Ailish offers him candles to put on his cake and suggests that there are four, and this is all written in a very uh, lovely, inclusive way. Um, and then um, we, uh, he shares his um, birthday cake with others in a very kind of inclusive way. Now, the story here isn't necessarily about the uh, birthday cake um, creation itself, but the way that um, Oleg is in complete control of um, the recording of this um, making of this birthday cake. Then the um, the member of staff who is writing the the story, this lovely um, story, writes about um, her uh, potential professional analysis of the learning that has taken place, and. And again, it's a very, very inclusive opportunity for Oleg to participate in this um, uh, uh, um, lived story. 
And then um, the member of staff comes up at the end and, and suggests a possible provocation because Oleg um, really loves um, making chocolate crispies and, um, and other um, experiences with food. And so um, we always call this a possible provocation and not a next step so that um, Oleg has the opportunity to select and choose whatever he would like to do to um, enhance his learning and his uh, knowledge. So in all these lived stories, um, children kind of articulate and reflect on their own experiences. They inform um, the, the follow up questions that can deepen the story. Um, and the, nar the narratives, as you can see, are very personal. They're written to him and um, members of uh, whoever's writing them writes uh, love at the end. So there's this real, very personal, very intimate um, a story that's written about the child. So this this isn't about um, recording on a, a homogenous kind of experience for the child. This is very, very um, much, very much related to this particular individual unique child. Um, as said, these are very intimate um, stories and there is no way that you could argue that this person doesn't know this child very well. And these stories are of course shared with the children and the children get to add um, whatever they choose to to the story because we might have got it wrong. Um, and also when they're uploaded, the parent then adds to them and shares it with the child and adds parts to it, which also informs us about how um, the child was, um, how the child responded to it. So Oleg, uh, which I never said earlier, uh, both parents have, um, their, their first language is in English and it's from two very different countries. And Oleg at the moment doesn't have um, a lot of English. Um, I don't think it will take very long before he does, but children make their own meaning of these stories which is really important. Um, we speak to the children, of course, about what these lived stories are about and how, uh, if they're important to them. And this text is quite small, but some of the children have said, I really like watching videos of me, um, which, which are often accompanied by the stories. Um, and um, Mona Callum and Orion, Orin here have connected their stories in many different ways and, and chatted about them and reflected on them. And Aggie says at the end there, I like having stories because it helps me remember the things I've done. And so we're constantly involving children in the whole process of the stories and, and writing these lived stories. Just a, a concluding point from me um, is that children, um, in writing up these stories, children have the right to participate. We really want to fight for children having the participate for them to be involved in their pedagogical documentation. Whether this be a lived story, but we really feel it's very important that children have a say in what is written about them. And um, of course, the professional analysis has to take place in order that we can support and extend children's learning. But children have a right to know um, what has been written about them. So they're very much involved in the whole process. They, a, a bit like what Sarah was saying, there's still like a, a printed out um, version of these stories that children can um, reflect on, look at, add to, um, uh, when they're uh, still in the centre. I've just added two references here that we, we wrote um, with regards to the, the, um, the development of these uh, lived stories um, and, and really what the children had to say. Um, so thank you very much for listening um, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you, Lynn. That was, that was fabulous as well. And the same with Sarah, you would just want to have more slides and more slides and, and hear more about this. So thank you so much for that. I think in terms of both speakers, what, what I'm taking from both your presentation, 
presentations today is just that real sense of that children are involved in every stage and that there, there isn't a stage that you wouldn't speak to them about or have their involvement. And, and as we know, um, working in the earlier sector, sometimes people that support older children often think that, well, we can't really ask the children that they're too young or the children wouldn't be able to tell us their thoughts about this, especially with even younger children. So I thought that both presentations um, were fabulous and just so insightful and so much to take away from them. And in terms of just listening to yours there, Lynn, I was thinking, I loved the fact that you said children are not finished products. <laughs> They're irregular and full of surprises. I love that. I think that's something I'll definitely share. And I think that comes across in, in your presentation. And when you reflect on the New Zealand curriculum as well, and and the, and the lived stories, I think that is wonderful. And the fact that you revisit the stories with the children because they, they do perhaps forget things, but then they want to add to them. But the fact that you then involve the parents and you involve the children again and the staff and just that essence of the children have a right to know what's been written about them. So I think that came through really strongly in both presentations that children's human rights are at the heart of, of the practice in, in both of your settings. And I think there's so many different ideas that I'm sure the participants here today can take away things that they can think, I think I'll try and replicate that. But I hope as well, um, in terms of early years practitioners um, that are listening today, I hope you, you can see your own practice within that, because sometimes you forget that you are doing this. You maybe don't label it as children's rights and right -based, rights based approaches. And maybe that that was part of your your journey too, and your exploration with your staff teams, you know, auditing what do we do well already and how how best we improve. So thank you both. Excellent presentations. And I'm going to move on now to some questions from the delegates. So the first question I've got here is how what support uh, sorry, how is the professional analysis shared um, or understood by the child? So I know you reflected on that, Lynn, um, within your presentation. So if I could come to you first and then maybe come to Sarah, but how is that an analysis shared? And that links back to what we're saying in terms of maybe presuming that children might not fully understand something. So was that difficult within your journey? Can I can I go back to one little bit? I think that um, we share the, the professional analysis not only with the children but also with other practitioners in order to ensure that um, we we if we have a briefing every morning, and we bring up amongst other things a, a, a recent lived story that someone has just written, and then we. We talk about that now. That means that everybody is aware of the the story, but also aware of the possible provocation that might emerge. So it may be that because we don't only um, write about we we don't only write about um, our our own key children. We write about any child. So it may be that a child is in the garden. You might not be in the garden. So it's really important that everybody has um, insight into. Um, what this child is doing, this little engineering thing they're doing with piping or, you know, whatever's happening. Um, and when we're writing the story with the children, we um, we <laughs> sometimes we, we say to them, oh, I've just written a story. Can I read it to you? Sometimes they will say no, <laughs> like some of them like, no, I'm not interested. But other times we're really interested in what what's going on. We discover really that our parents are really, really engaged. Um, so, and we write that up in our newsletters as well. So, parents will um, inform us of um, when we put up a lived story that's been shared with the children, and we think it's uh, you know an accurate account of what happened. You know, parents will often come back and tell us something else that's mm -hmm. that adds to it, and then we can go back to the parents. So there's this lovely iterative process of the stories being shared with the child, both in the the centre and also at home. That is wonderful. Thank you. You can really you can really hear that coming through your presentation. Um, there are other questions coming in, so rather than um, continue with that one, if I can come to you, Sarah. 
The, the next question is, what do you think, um, what support do you think is needed for practitioners in meeting children's rights in terms of the early years sector? So can you think in anything through your own journey and your own experience? I, I can. Um, uh, when we were awarded the Innovation, Early Years Innovation Award, part of um, being presented with that award was actually being asked to do a whole year's research project. And one of the um, areas that we wanted to look at was developing um, practitioners' confidence, listening to children. Because what was tending to happen was because I had nurtured the approach from my, my degree, I was too involved. So I, as a senior, backed off and gave the other members of staff space and time and, and they took it. They, For instance, at the beginning of that year, um, I had no involvement in making the map with children. And this is a two, year, two week period of time where we make the map. We allow them to have lots of time to explore the environment, take photos, cut and make the map. But I had no involvement and the practitioners were involved. So um, from my perspective, it was giving other people um, the role to take things forward, um, stepping back myself. And then from that point, their confidence really grew. And um, throughout that whole year, we, we were developing confidence and developing um, the whole, for the way of listening to children further. And um, another way that we developed um, practitioner sort of ability was also to have many discussions together as a team. And that worked a lot. So, you know, if somebody had been doing some um, planning with a child and listening, um, there, was, there was more sharing going on amongst the team. And that made a huge difference, um, sharing together. And, um, Again, that, that allowed other members of staff who were maybe not involved in that child's ideas to um, you know, have a further understanding and then they could access their play or their wishes the following day. So, so these sort of ideas um, helped everybody's confidence. Um, and, and then we, we, we spoke about literature as well, right space literature. Um, yeah, I, I can't really think of a whole lot more, but over a whole year, everybody did develop their practice. And, and we had someone at the end saying that, you know, she'd learned an awful lot and now she absolutely adored using the map um, with the children. And at the beginning of the year, she had been the least, the least confident. So it's so, you know, it worked, whatever we did. <laughs> That's excellent. Thank you. Some really helpful tips in there. Um, thank you both. And another question for you is that you've both clearly been working on embedding children's rights in early years for many years now. So before the UNCR, UNCRC was being incorporated into law, what inspired you to embrace and embed children's human rights? So if I go back to, to Lynn, um, yeah. before all of this, what, yeah. what inspired you? I, I think when um, you're absolutely right, I, I think for me, certainly something that um, was really important I think it's been important all my life as a, a practitioner, if I'm honest. I think that um, I've always questioned adults' power and I kind of have always, you know, I remember um, we, we uh, were an investing in children organisation. The, 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 we got the uh, an award for, for that. And one of the, the fundamental uh, statements there is that adults are not always right. And, and I just love that because, um, you know, if you came to Cowgate, you know, children um, walk in the office, they pick up the phone, you know, if the phone rings and you're typing away, you can say to the child, would you mind getting that? And of course, they think it's their mother or their granny, but, um, you know, and they're really because it's it, it's as much their environment as it is ours. And I kind of feel that. So, so back to the question, sorry, I think that it's something you really feel fundamentally inside. I think it's something that's, um, I, I really believe that, um, you know, children are exactly like us, just smaller. And uh, sometimes they've got 
more better experiences of um, childhood than us because we've sometimes forgotten ours. So they're the experts on childhood and we might be the experts on something else. But I feel that we need to always remember that they bring so very much to um, each experience. And I think it's always worth having that dialogue with them. Absolutely. Thank you. I think that, that's um, spot on and I think you're right, it has to, you know, you have to have that desire to take that forward and, and that's then communicated across the staff team. I love the, the answering the phone. <laughs> Could you get that? Um, so next question, you know, lots of questions, I'm not sure we'll get through them all, but I'll maybe pose this one to yourself now, Sarah. And um, do you think that the increase to 1140 hours has impacted or may impact on practitioners' ability to, to meet children's rights? Do you think, do you see it having an impact? Um, or do you think that, no, it's, it's still, it's not impacting on your practice? Well, I'll, I'll just talk from a personal point of view. Um, in our setting, we've already changed our practice with, with the map. Um, completely because of the 1140 hours. We used to create one map every year, and in that one map was an area for the outside space at the top and an area for the inside space. But purely from our, our observations of children um, and the way they played with, with the increased hours, we were noticing that all their plans, just about all their plans, were being written about outside play. Mm -hmm. um, and so we adapted our approach. And this year, we've got two maps and a massive map for just the outside space um, with really big photos. We've gone for big photos. And then the inside space, um, because there are probably more areas really inside, we've gone for little photos. But just the fact that we changed our practice because of the 1140 hours from seeing seeing their play. So, um, you know, for us, them using the map, talking about their play, um, that's to us is our way that we see their rights and their rights to have a voice. So, so yes, for us, it, it, that was a really positive, really positive outcome. And they loved the big map. And they still write more map, more plans about being outside than inside. So yeah, that so for us, it's been very positive. Yeah, excellent. Thanks. Amazing. Good way of seeing it. Thank you, Sarah. Um, the next question, Lynn, if that's okay, with regard to I'm um, doing the lived stories and the narrative around that. Quite a pertinent question, which can be um, challenging for early years practitioners, is maybe the, the, the workload and the paperwork. So how frequently, you've maybe been asked this before, how frequently would, um, for example, the stories be written up? Because obviously there's some anxieties and challenges around bureaucracy and paperwork and just that potentially taking you away from the floor and, and engaging with children. So you must have mastered a way around that, I'm sure. Yeah, the one thing we do is that we, we've as a, a leadership team or a management team, we've um, we, I, I don't know how to say it, but give the this the staff have got this hour and a half out the the room every week. Now they can choose to do that um, actually at home if they wish to do that, or they can do it with in the nursery and upload it then. So there's there's the opportunity for them to. Um, I, you know, do and and back to uh, quality or quantity. It often is just one story a week, perhaps that um, mm -hmm. people write, um, and we don't, we don't. There's no blame game. So if there's a child that maybe hasn't had one, we don't say, "Oh, why is a child not had one?" We all sit down and and genuinely ask that question. Why has nobody found anything to write on George this week, mm -hmm. or or? not this week probably but you know not not written on george so we're asking ourselves those questions in a very professional manner it's a non-blame game it's about um just exploring 
why nobody has actually noticed George um, yes. and rather than blaming. So I, I totally agree with um, the questioner um, <laughs> that it can be an arduous process, of course, because they're quite lengthy, but they're they're really worthwhile. And most of them will be individual ones, but some will be a group one. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, it might be that they've gone on a trip somewhere and it's maybe ended up being a little bit of a group one, um, but they are Abs we've carved out that time and that is their precious time for doing that and and I think that that really works um, so it means that we totally value it and uh, that process and also respect that this is people's uh, the practitioner's time they would not need to feel um, guilty or anything about not being in the playroom with the children because we've got it all worked out within um, the shift patterns. That's wonderful. That's really, really helpful. I think there'll be a lot of people hoping to introduce a plan like that because it is so difficult um, to get time and space within early years, isn't it, when you're um, with the children for long periods of time. So that sounds like a really good and sensible approach. Um, I'm going to take one of my last questions um, and it is quite interested in it as well. So if I maybe go back to Sarah, if that's okay, so a question has come in saying, do you formally introduce the concept of rights with children at the start of the year, you know, for your new intake, etc.? Do you do you do that in a formal way or do you do it in a very through child centred practice through your pedagogy? Um, it's I wouldn't say formally, it's probably more drip fed throughout the whole year. There are various things we will do with them. We have the um the image beside the map um i think it's sorry i'll just hold this little thing up there it's it's that <laughs> care inspector image um we also have them as sticks but um so they love these images the children they're fascinated by them and and the images come into their talk all day and so naturally through their interest we talk about the images and we um the one about nurtured you know we'll mention that that's about the care and the love you need to have and that it is your right to have this care and love. So through our conversation with these lovely images, um, we bring in the word right to them. And you know, when we're talking about, we are listening now, I want to listen to you. We very often say, you know, this is your right. It's really important to us. Um, and, and we also turn it around. We say, you know, will you please listen to me? And it's my right too. So, so they like that. They love that, and and they're, you know, they're really on it. Um, I, yeah. Uh, there's another thing. There's a there's a wonderful book. If I'm allowed to show it for every child. Um, the text is a, is a wrote it down. The text is adapted by um, Caroline Castle for every child, and it's it's been done by UNICEF, and it's the um, rights illustrated in a beautiful way. And the children love this book. So um, every now and then we bring that out. Um, for instance, we were having a conversation about play and I have just written it down the other day. And we spoke about, you know, article 31 and what he meant. it meant, looked at the beautiful illustrations. And one little girl said, um, you know, I know what it is. It's I play lots and lots and lots. Then I go to bed then I play lots and lots and lots. So, you know, she's got it. Um, so really it's throughout the whole year, we're bringing into our conversations, you know, respect, listening, rights. We probably don't formalize it by saying article 12, but it's just more through our conversation. Yeah, I hope that helps. <clears throat> that really does. Thank you, Sarah. And, and thank you, Lynn. Both um, excellent presentations and I'm sure the participants will have got a lot out of that because I know I did as well. Can I ask your permission, Lynn and Sarah, can we share presentations? There's been lots of requests coming in to have a copy. Is that okay for us to have permission to do that? Wonderful. Well, the final um, part of today's session, I just want to take this opportunity to encourage you all to sign up as an unfearty if you are not already. So as many of you will have heard the term and seen the campaigns around this, unfearties are people who are courageous 
in discussing children's issues and children's rights and are making a difference in children's lives and who are willing to speak up for and stand alongside children. And we've clearly heard that today as well. So before I finish up, I would like you in the Q&A box, can you share one thing that you feel you will take away from today's event? Just one thing that you think you will proactively do or share or take away, we would love to hear from you. And after today, Children's Parliament will send you an email and they'll give you a link to the webpage for Unfairties and how you can sign up, details of the final webinar that's coming up for the session and a link for the evaluation. And as we know, it's so important if you get a couple of minutes to try and complete this for us, it's always really helpful. So thank you hugely for taking the time and space to attend today's event and we really look forward to seeing you at our next conversation in this series on the 18th of January and thank you once again to Lynn and Sarah. As I say, I'm sure we could have all have listened um, to you both for much longer, but it gives us a real snapshot of things that we can take forward in terms of how we really embed children's human rights in early years. And I think we all, I think we do that real, really well in early years in general. Um, so I'm sure there's, there's a lot of collaborative working we could do with primary and other sectors too, but fabulous ideas from today. So thank you both so much. And thank you everyone who has been attending remotely, though we can't see you all. Um, thank you again.